So right here we have the LNB that I bought. Uh, you have seen this used in the previous video. I used this to receive the beacon from the Astra 3B communication satellite. And I also promised in the, in the video before we would do a teardown and see exactly what's inside an LNB like this. Why I think this LNB is especially interesting is simply because it's quite literally the cheapest LNB that I could buy. I have the box over here. It's a Tesla TL100 LNB. It cost me four dollars or euro since it's the same currently i bought it in like 2022 so i will i thought it would be interesting to take a look inside to see what the cheapest lnb on the market currently actually has inside in terms of like the build quality and and the components used and how it is possible that it's so cheap but before we actually do that i'm gonna put the lnb aside and i want to take a look at the box so i'm gonna zoom in a little bit because there are a few things that the that the manufacturer or rather the distributor of this LNB thought would be worth pointing out. Now this is in Czech, but you can probably deduce what it says just by looking at the at the symbols on the left side. The first one says that it has an LTE filter. The other one says that the that the noise figure of the LNB is 0.1 dB. Okay. The third one mentions that it supports 4K and UHD, and we are gonna see that repeated on the other side, even in English. And the last one says it has high gain. So the high gain that is believable that, because that's a requirement for all LNBs. However, all the other ones I'm pretty sure are just marketing buzzwords that don't mean anything. First of all, 0.1 dB noise figure I think is just a straight out lie. There is no going around that. I highly doubt this LNB achieves a 0.1 dB noise figure at the KU band. I don't have a way to prove that claim, but I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go out and say that's just not true at all. The one under it, it says it supports 4K and UHD, and if we if we flip it over here, it repeats it here even in English, 4K and UHD compliant. Now again, this is a marketing buzzword. Technically, yeah, you can receive 4K and UHD signals with it, but as you have seen in the previous video, we can also just connect it to an SDR and receive literally any radio signal with any modulation that exists. So this has nothing to do with the LNB. And the 4K and UHD support, your receiver needs to support 4K and UHD. And the satellite needs to transmit it. The LNB has absolutely nothing to do with it. The LNB has no idea what kind of signal it's receiving or what kind of modulation the signal is using. And the one on the top, I kind of want to mention last. Again, this is a meaningless statement because LTE that's going to be on like, let's say, 800 to 900 megahertz, then maybe at... 17 to 1800 megahertz and then 2100 megahertz the lnb as they even state over here operates between 10.7 and 12.7 gigahertz so there is no way the lte can even interfere with the lnb in the first place because it's just so far apart and even the waveguide of the lnb it has to be a specific size right it physically needs to be the size of some fraction of the wavelength so it would not let the kind of LTE signals inside in the first place. Now the IF output or the output frequency it does say it is 0 to 2150 megahertz and here it actually says it's rather 950 to 2150 because that's probably more accurate. You could maybe argue that this is where the LTE filter would be effective however if you think about it if you put a filter on your IF output, well then you are just filtering out your IF output because you need those frequencies that LTE would normally be operating at, you can't filter them out. So it can be on the, it has no effect on the RF input, it has no effect on the IF output, so which is why I'm saying it's just a marketing claim which means nothing. Now of course this none of this is the LNB's fault, it's, it's probably, it's actually decent for 4 euro and I was surprised by how stable it was, so let's Put the LNB back in its in its place. Take a closer look at it. I actually don't think I did it justice in the previous video. I think this LNB is much more stable than I first expected, which is why after the teardown we are going to do a more, you know, a better test of this LNB at some other satellites. But now let's see if we can take it apart without breaking it. And I know that's possible because I already I already had it apart before. So don't be too surprised when I flip it and we see I already cracked it open a little bit because it's pretty, it's pretty annoying to get in 
as the plastic is just held together by by tabs there are no screws or anything like that so i'm gonna finish the job by stabbing this little plastic thing inside and there we go the two halves of the unbeat cover just open up like this and we have the unbeat now of course we still have this yellow plastic cap on the waveguide input however this one actually i don't believe i can take apart without damaging it which is something i don't really want to do which is why if we go right here i've prepared another lnb an older one so we'll have a take we'll have a look inside here because these waveguides are mostly going to be identical it's just the electronics that's changed over time and if we take a look inside it's the same thing that you have seen in the in the video about the satellite dish antenna we see the two probes the okay this one would be the vertical one this one would be the horizontal one and these are actually going to the pcb that's that's in the cover or in this case in here so that's what the we've got looks inside i uh, again i don't want to damage the cap right here so not a lot to see there we have to open up the cover of the of the circuit board again you can see i already did it normally the entire thing would be covered in this white waterproofing material whatever that is probably silicon or or something like that we can see this lnb also has the the led plastic piece i'm gonna put it down and the led itself which you can see and the led itself is on the circuit board and to get to the circuit board we have to unscrew in this case just three screws and they use this kind of head kind of the star one undoing the screws quite simple normally you would have to step the screwdriver through the waterproofing but i already take it taken it out you can just take out the screws completely now we should be able to pop the cover open and there we have the circuit board so i'm going to mount the lnb on something better to hold it against the camera and we're going to talk about the circuit board a little bit so here we have the LNB taken apart and we can take a better look at the circuit board. I'm probably gonna get some things wrong in this video, but if you want to learn more about like what these little squiggly lines mean or why are there random shapes basically all over the board, I'm going to recommend the RF Path channel, which is going to be linked in the description. There you can learn a lot about RF circuit design like this. I'm just going to go over the very basic features that are just obvious and visible when we look at the pcb like this so let's start on this side because this is where the rf signals from the satellite are actually actually received and transferred onto the pcb we can see the two solder blobs one is here and one is over here and this is where the actual probes of the where the actual antenna probes are connected that protrude inside the waveguide which you have seen when we looked at the at the other piece other at the other lnb so those are what actually collect the signals that are reflected by your dish antenna. And the first thing both of them go into, you can see the very short trace between the antenna and this black rectangle over here, the same thing over here. So these are the first stage amplifiers. So at this high frequency, you want to amplify your signal as soon as possible. So you have a very short trace going into an amplifier and then being amplified and going out over here. You can see some squiggly lines here. One, one is here, one is here, another one here. Although this is more just a very thin line. These essentially act as inductors. And as we know, the RF or the radio frequencies don't, can't go through the inductor. So they only see basically this path over here, which allows you to supply direct current to the amplifier, which is how you power it. So these amplifiers seem like they require DC on both the input and the output. Uh, normally amplifiers that I've worked with would only require the DC from the output side. But these are some different transistors or whatever, I don't really know. There we see a capacitor, which makes sure no DC gets from this stage into this stage while letting all the RF pass through. And we can see both the outputs of the amplifiers in the first stage converge into a single point over here. And there we, there we have a second stage amplifier, which just does the same thing. It just amplifies the signal more. 
This is a single LNB with a single output, which means only one of these amplifiers is going to be on at, at one time, which is why they can just be joined together basically on the input. So this is the vertical probe. So when you supply 13 volts to the LNB, this amplifier gets turned on, gets turned on and we get vertical polarization. And if you supply 18 volts to the LNB, this amplifier is turned on and we get horizontal polarization. So this probe is kind of in an, like an L shape. It goes down and then inside the waveguide horizontally. On the output of the second stage amplifier, we see like the most prominent feature of the PCB probably. And this is a band pass filter. So this makes sure only the RF range that we want to receive with this LNB gets into the mixing chip, which is, which is right here. You can see these kinds of filters. Some other LNBs use different kinds where you have just a straight trace with, a, with kind of a notch going out the side, but it achieves the same thing, which is just filtering out unwanted frequencies. You, have, you primarily want to filter out frequencies that are below your local oscillator value, so you can have some radars use that frequency or even other military satellites, and you don't want that to be basically mixing from the lower side of the LO together with your RF signals and interfering with them. Now, arguably, this filter is probably what they meant by by the LTE filter on the box. However, I mean, technically, yeah, it does filter out LTE, but so does the waveguide physically, because LTE at 1.8 or 2.1 gigahertz is going to have a very hard time getting into a waveguide that's tuned for like 12 gigahertz or, or 11 gigahertz in this case. We obviously see no such filter on the output because you can't filter out parts of your output IF then you will just lo lose the signals altogether. These shapes that kind of protrude from the from the traces, we can see why one here, one here, this one isn't even connected. Another one here and here. These are there most likely for impedance matching to keep the impedance of the trace close to 50 ohm, I'm guessing is what, what this will be using. And finally we get to the, to the chip where you can see the trace kind of shrinks down and goes into one of the legs of the, of the single chip here. So in the past with LNBs that use the dielectric oscillators, you would have a lot more circuitry over here, but all of this is now integrated into this chip. The LO, the local oscillator value is produced here. We see these two, these two solder joints. On the other side of the PCB, there is a crystal oscillator probably at 27 megahertz. And that works as a reference frequency, as a reference signal for the chip which then has a frequency multiplier inside and depending on what is on the what is being signaled to it by the receiver so by default it would multiply the 27 megahertz frequency from the crystal up to 9.75 gigahertz which is the default local oscillator frequency and if you signal it to change to the high band it would increase its multiplication value and generate 10.6 gigahertz the IF output connector is over here this is the F connector where it is connected and you can see a trace going right here into the chip and this is the IF output. There's another trace going out of it, again another squiggly line which acts as an inductor and that's how the chip is extracting the direct current supply and probably also the 22 kHz control signal and all of that is going through a resistor into a voltage regulator probably. Here we see the LED and the voltage regulator most likely takes it down to 5 volts. I actually don't know, I'm gonna look the, the number up and then it's used for supplying the chip as well as the other amplifiers. So as you can see not very complicated inside once you kind of break it down into the different sections. In a future video I definitely want to take a look at the DRO LNBs especially some of the very old ones where we will be able to see a lot more circuitry right over here. So right now this is probably the most complicated part of the PCB and that's the circuit for the for the PLL. I'm gonna be honest, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but that's basically what the LNB uses as a reference to create the local oscillator value from the from the crystal frequency. So now I'm going to put the LNB back together and we're gonna go outside and test it out, see if it still works. Okay, so just to kind of explain how the testing is going to work, you can see I have the LNB mounted, powered up and aimed at the Q100 satellite. I'm gonna rotate the dish slightly because it's 
it's interfering with the audio. The idea is that I find a signal at 11 GHz, which is right sort of where the LNB is rated to work. There we go. There are some signals. And preferably I would find a very narrow one. Again, I'm gonna do this off screen. I'm gonna find some narrow signals. And the idea is that I'm going to record that signal with the LNB that I'm currently testing, which is the cheap four euro LNB currently. And I'm gonna run it through a demodulator in the computer, which will give me an, an exact value of the signal to noise ratio that the LNB is receiving it at. And the reason I want to do it this way is because when I go when I go over here, you can see I have another LNB prepared. This is the bullseye LNB, which is sort of the standard used for receiving the Q100 satellite. Basically, I'm gonna record some narrow signals with this LNB and then record the exact same signal with this LNB. And we are going to compare the maximum signal to noise ratio that I'm gonna receive the signal at. That way, no matter how badly I aim the dish, as long as I kinda shake it around, it's going to receive the signal at the maximum strength at some point. And we're just going to compare the two values. Uh, the reason I want to do kind of a relative measurement instead of an absolute, like we're looking at the strength the LNB is receiving at, is because, well, I don't have any test equipment that would be able to properly determine the noise figure and other parameters of the LNB. Yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to talk about and show you kind of the setup that I have. See, this is why the KU band is interesting. Look at this. Who knows what this what this signal is? It's change. It's changing rates. I do, I'm not even aiming at any specific satellite. This is just some random satellite in. Okay, whatever. Uh, I'm getting distracted. So that's how I'm going to be measuring the the sort of signal strength or quality. Of course, I said that the dish is what affects the signal strength the most. Obviously, so ideally, perfect LNBs would have exactly the same signal strength as long as they are using the same diameter dish. So if we see the signal is weaker with this LNB, it means this LNB has a higher noise figure. But to test the stability, we can use Q100 and then we, there we actually don't need the reference LNB at all because Q100 in this case is the preferred target because we know exactly from the website of the, of the radio club that operates it we know exactly what these signals frequencies should be so we can just simply measure the difference and figure out how stable this cheap LNB or any other LNB I'm going to be testing in the future actually is. Right, so welcome to the 720p laptop. I did some configuration in OBS so the video quality should be a bit better but I can increase the bitrate anymore because then the laptop will just not be able to play back a recording, record the screen and record my voice in Audacity at the same time. Anyway. I did the tests exactly as I kind of described them. What you are watching on the screen right now is me trying to aim the dish at the test signal during quite heavy wind, as you can tell. And I recorded the signal with the TL100 LNB and with the Bullseye LNB. And then I ran this signal through a demodulator. I figured out what its bitrate is, what its symbol rate rather is, and modulation, which is QPSK, something around 300. 20,000, I think, I forgot. It, do, it, it literally doesn't matter. Uh, what does matter though is that in the first test, and I did this twice, and I'm gonna tell you why, in the first test I got about 2 dB worse signal from the bullseye. So I repeated the test again just to make sure a day later, and I got the exact opposite result. In, in After repeating the test the bullseye was actually around 2 dB better than the TL100. So, the conclusion is that this test is garbage and I'm not gonna do it anymore because it, there are just too many inconsistencies, too many variables such as the position of the LNB inside the dish clamp. It was a, it was a nice idea, right, doing a relative test between the LNB that I'm testing and some reference LNB, but there's simply, as I said, way too many variables. So, I'm gonna try to think of doing it a better way for the next video or we're not gonna do it at all however with all this said so we can just disregard this uh, by the way i'm we are looking at the if frequency i don't have the shift enabled currently we are going to move on to the stability test or the lo precision test for which i don't need the bullseye lnb and i actually just aims the lnb at the q100 satellite or s hail 2 as you may know it 
and we have the recording here. So first up, before we actually talk about the LNB's precision, I was really surprised. I was really surprised by how strong the signal is on an 80 centimeter dish. Maybe I was just using really garbage LNBs up until now. That's possible because I got to the Bullseye LNB very recently. But this is the TL100 LNB. This is the $4 LNB and we are getting the, just the transponder noise floor alone about 5 dB above the above the normal noise about above the ambient noise floor so that is that is very good uh, once you start seeing the transponder noise floor like this it basically means you have maxed out your signal to noise ratios for any signals on the transponder so this is as good as it can possibly get uh, that's probably not the case for the wideband transponder but I haven't I haven't looked at that so but yeah for four dollar LNB what about the stability right now we are kind of zoomed out and we can't really see how stable the local oscillator is. So first up, I'm going to switch to a different recording, which is at a lower sample rate. So we have a longer recording where we are kind of more zoomed in. And we are going to take a look at the middle beacon, which is over here. The question is, what is the frequency offset? So to see that, uh, when I was recording this, the LMB was already powered up for probably over half an hour, maybe closer to an hour, so I wanted to let it kind of stabilize in temperature. We can actually kind of cycle through the recording a little bit and just do this, then pause and we can sort of just eyeball where the where the center is, let's say here, and now we can look at a difference between this intermediate frequency value and the expected value from the Q100 beacon. Okay, so we should be seeing the center of the beacon. I had to quickly look it up because I completely forgot. At 10 gigahertz, 489 megahertz and 750 kilohertz. So because we are looking at the IF value, we have to subtract 9750 megahertz from that. And we should be seeing this beacon, this frequency right here. We should be seeing at 739. 750 so right here right in the middle of where I was tuned basically and we get a difference between the expected frequency and the real frequency of only 41 kilohertz so that is I would say quite decent and we can actually kind of confirm that by going into some wider mode and we can kind of just take a look at it that indeed the difference in frequency is only around 42 kilohertz so that's quite decent, but that's just the overall difference in frequency. What about the stability? To see that better, we, we are going to zoom into the narrowband section. And I'm going to switch to USB and turn on the audio. And we can kind of have a listen to the lower beacon, for example. So yeah, you can definitely hear some drifting and even see it on the waterfall. But is it really that bad? If we, we are gonna go back to the beginning, as you can see, it's quite a bit big difference there. But it's definitely manageable if you are manually tuning in. And if we are going to go to the upper frequency, let's see if we can hear some, some USB voice over here. So right now I'm not touching it at all. It's just kind of drifting along in the inside the tuner bandwidth, and you can hear the voice. It's it's fine. There is some drifting, so I'm gonna correct it a little bit now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Klaus. In the boat, uh, in the room, of the sunshine day. Okay, thank you very much, Klaus. No problem. Uh, yeah, this is this this is usable. This is definitely usable. You can take a look. Thank you. 
I think this is the multimedia beacon. We're not gonna see her up there. This is the upper beacon. I mean, this is not bad, right? It's a $4 LNB. It's the cheapest LNB I could buy, and it, the performance is just... I'm just blown away. We can take a look at this lot, where people are doing FT8. That's always fun to listen to. So the kind of whistling sounds, the drifting, that's part of the modulation, that's not actually the LNB. That's how FT8 modulates its data. We actually... There's some Morse code here, that's probably better. Yeah, actually let's go to CW and see how long we can... Yeah, now the drifting is kinda there. Someone is doing FT8 here, it seems like. Not sure why why he would do that. Let's see. Yeah, and I'm not touching it right now. I mean, it works, right? I, I've... <laughs> I was expecting it to be worse, I was expecting more content right now where we will be looking at wow, it's, it's really drifting a lot, but it's not doing that, it's, it's just working, it's working just fine. Okay, now we are getting, now it's drifting outside of the, of the bandwidth, let's see. It definitely does need some human intervention every once in a while, but overall, it's just fine, it's usable. What the hell is this? Someone doing really hype over CW, okay. So let's give you 100 for you, that's the LNB test. It's a $4 LNB, it works really well. This sounds like AGS TV, hold on. I wanted to end the video right now, but I just got distracted. It's really that's really awesome. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We're receiving we are receiving an image from F4CYH. And I don't really need to do a lot of manual tuning. We got two bad blocks so far only. Okay, three. Never mind. Right, and we are nearing the end. We got a few missed blocks. Especially here where the signal kind of drifted away. And I'm gonna quickly, I'm gonna quickly replay. And let's see if KGS TV... Nope. It did not... Right, so I, I was hoping it would just start uh, from, the, from the beginning, but I think I just don't have it configured properly. Uh, I'm gonna try to capture the full image, or at least most of it, and show you <laughs> in post. Anyway, yeah, so that's it. $4 LNB, Q100, works great. There is some drift, it requires some manual correction every so often, but I'm gonna say this has been a success. So yeah, I'm surprised. Not sure about you. Let me know in the comments what, what kind of LNB you are using, if you thought. Because I, I've read this quite often when the Bullseye LNB is, is presented as an absolute necessity. Or if you are gonna be using a PLL LNB like this, you have to modify it to use a GPS oscillator reference. And we can see it right here with our own eyes. But yeah, that's, uh, that concludes the video, that concludes the teardown and test video. I'm probably gonna cut out a lot of it, so it's not really long. 
uh, for the future videos, I already have a few LNBs I really want to take a look inside of. And I think you will find it interesting too. And in the meantime, I'm gonna try to get some other interesting ones from abroad, probably. I don't know. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you learned something, at least as much as I have, because I, I'm gonna be honest, I did not expect this LNB to, to work this well. Especially considering the other ones I tried, even other PLL ones. But yeah, thank you for watching. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you would like to see more, and I'll see you next time.